Well, once again, good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. I want to thank Bob and Peg for being our Advent candle lighters this week. And I want to thank Clark for our music. And I hope that when I finish my sermon, you will tune in and hear Clark's closing pieces for this day also. Christmas is coming. And when we're recording this, we're actually a week from Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve is indeed this Thursday. And we will not be having services here in our sanctuary, as I'm sure by now you know. But we will have music from Clark, and we will have my homily that I was planning on giving if we were all in here. And we will have a final closing song of Silent Night by Clark. We just won't be able to light candles with each other. But you can, while you're sitting in your house, light your own candles if you wish. So uh, really greatly apologize for that. But as you know, it's out of our control. But I'm glad you're here with us today and hope you'll be with us here, not only Christmas Eve, but also this coming Sunday, December the 27th, as I wrap up this Advent series. Let's uh, pray together, shall we? God, we give you thanks for our day. We thank you for your blessing. I thank you for the season. I thank you for those that, that lit the candles not only today, but the previous three weeks and those that will be doing so on Christmas Eve. We thank you for the music that Clark has provided. I thank you for the work of of, of Larry Newcomen, who is very instrumental in, in seeing that this gets put out on YouTube as well as being recorded. Lord, I thank you for Diane being here. She wants to sit here and listen to a live sermon. And so, God, we thank you for it. Again, your word, it says, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in your midst. So, Lord, we welcome you and we thank you. Guide us now in your word. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You know, it's interesting if you listen to the reading that Bob McElroy did today on this, the fourth Sunday of Advent, the Sunday for Joseph within what we're doing this year in our Advent theme. The scripture text that he read is the scripture text from my sermon. And not trying to be redundant, but, but I'd like to read it again. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus, Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. I, I, I'm sorry, folks. Every time I read that, I want to laugh. I'm a righteous man, so I want to divorce you quietly. <laughs> I still want to divorce you. <laughs> Whether it's publicly or quietly, I, I, I just don't get it. He, he doesn't want to have anything to do with Mary. The one thing that he knows, she is pregnant, and it isn't his child. And so he is deciding to get rid of her. But after he had considered this, he'd already made up his mind. An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. You know, if you've read the Gospel of Luke, it starts with the coming of John the Baptist. And, and it starts with Elizabeth and Zechariah. Elizabeth, who was called barren, and she is a cousin of Mary, the mother of Jesus. And we read in that story where Zechariah, while serving as the high priest on Yom Kippur, goes into the Holy of Holies, the one day of the year they do that, and there he's approached by an angel. Same one that comes to talk to Joseph, we don't know. But there he's approached, and he's told, you are going to be the father. Your wife is called barren, is, is already expecting, and she's going to give birth to a son. And Zechariah doesn't believe this. And therefore, he can't speak until the child is born. And what's really interesting about that, after she gives birth, and they want to name the child, she says his name is John. Well, the, the family members that are hanging around says, there's nobody in our family named John. Why in the world do you want to name him John? And, and, and Zechariah writes on a piece of parchment, his name is John. And upon that, Zechariah can speak again. And everybody's amazed at what's going on. The interesting thing in that story in Luke is that 
They are naming a child something that's out of the ordinary for the family. There's nobody in that family named John. Here in Matthew's reading, the angel tells Joseph, your wife's going to give birth and you are going to name him Jesus. The Hebrew is Yeshua. The Greek, by the way, is Jesus. But he says, you will name him Jesus, Yeshua, because he will save his people from their sins. Those of us who read English and we have no idea of the Greek language or the Hebrew language, uh, we don't see the connection between what he's being told, you will name this child Jesus, which by the way, is the same thing that Mary is told in the Gospel of Luke, you will name your child Jesus. We're told because he will save his people from the sins, and we go, okay, so? Well, the name Yeshua, which can also be pronounced Yoshua or Yohoshua, depending on which way you emphasize the Greek, I mean, excuse me, the Hebrew letters. Yoshua, you might recognize as Joshua. Yoshua, Yohoshua means God will be salvation or God is salvation. Now that in itself to me is incredibly fascinating. You will name this child God is salvation because he will save his people from their sins. You, you see the connection there? We don't read in Matthew's gospel, we don't read in Luke's gospel where people come along and say, well, why do you want to name him Yeshua? But it's the same type of thing. You're going to give this child a name that's not connected to your family, but it is connected to who, what he will be and who he will be and what he will do. You will name him Yeshua because he will save his people from their sins. Now, I told you Yeshua also means Joshua. It's not coincidental that Joshua was the one who picked up the mantle after Moses. Moses is told, you cannot go into the promised land. But Joshua will go. So what does Joshua do? Joshua takes the people into the promised land, which they had been told that you will have after 400 years of slavery. He leads them into the promised land. He leads them to salvation. Well, this Joshua, this Yeshua, this Jesus is going to lead people into a whole different type of salvation, not just a promised land, but a promise of life. Matthew in his gospel continues after this, the angel saying, you will name him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Matthew goes on to say, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. And the prophet is Isaiah, the, the, the very person whose text I've been on this entire Advent season. And in Matthew is quoted as saying, the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now, have you ever come across one of these things that for you or me, it's a joyous thing, something happy, something just, just wonderful, but yet for the original person, it's, it's really not joyous at all. I don't know you guys, I, I can't think of any equivalent to talk about to give you an example. But for us, oh boy, for the people what's going on, it's like, oh, yuck. This Isaiah passage that... <laughs> that Matthew quotes here as being a fulfillment is really kind of an oh yuck. And I don't know if most of us know that. Let's go back to that passage in Isaiah, which happens to be Isaiah chapter seven. If I start at where the text says, verse 10, it says this, again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, ask Yahweh what your God for a sign whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not put Yahweh to the test. Now, you, we, we want to go, good for you, Ahaz. Don't put Yahweh to the test. Isn't, it, isn't that, it's exactly what Jesus says 
to, to the devil when he's being tempted, thou will not test Yahweh our God. He's just not going to do it, and, and we can go a little more than that. Good for you, Ahaz, even though it's being asked, ask Yahweh your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. No, nope, no, nope, not going to do it. I'm not going to tempt my God. Not going to happen. I, I'm, nope, not asking for any sign. Any, 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 any sign. <laughs> then Isaiah said, Hear now, you house of David. Is it not enough to try the patience of human beings? Will you try the patience of my God also? And, and you want to sit back and go, wait a minute. What do you do? Why is Isaiah all of a sudden seemingly a little upset at Ahaz? You're, you're, you're trying the patience of human beings. Are you going to try the patience of God too? And you go, wait, 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 talk about How is he trying the patience of God? But instead of waiting for an answer, Isaiah goes on. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. And then it's that verse that's quoted in Matthew chapter 1. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means, parenthetically, God with us. He will eat curds and honey when he knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right. But before the boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, the land of the two kings you dread will be laid waste. Yahweh will bring on you and your people and on the house of your father a time unlike any since Ephraim broke away from Judah. He will bring the king of Assyria. That's the reading that Matthew quotes when he's relating the visit of the angel to Joseph. But as I said, we read that in Matthew and we go, oh, that's marvelous, God with us. And by the way, I think we should go, oh, that's marvelous. I think that's a wonderful thing. Okay. Go back to my sermon last week. But here in the passage of Isaiah, you are trying the patience of God. Therefore, even though you don't ask it, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will will be with child and will give birth to a son. So you see, and I say, it's almost a rebuke. God says, please give, ask for a sign. And you go, nope, nope, not going to do that. Look, at, if God asks you to do something, what should your response be? Do it, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, Lord, yes. How's that song? Yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. You know, but... In this case, Ahaz says, no, I'm not going to. And so the retort comes back, well, I'll tell you what, God's going to give you a sign. And this is going to be the sign. The virgin will give birth to a son. So in, in a way, this in Isaiah is, is not really a joyful thing because with it comes that final line in there. Uh, here's what's going to happen to you. You are going to get the king of Assyria, which wasn't a good thing. But in Matthew's gospel, this very same reading becomes the reading of a promise and of a blessing and of a reminder of that which was said through Isaiah. The Lord will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. You know, the interesting thing in the time of history that all this was written, especially at the time of, of Israeli history, Israel had been without a prophet for 400 years. No prophets, no one coming and saying, thus saith the Lord. Not to say they didn't see some activity of God in the midst of that. That's where the apocryphal books are there the, the miracle that is known as the, the, the festival of lights Hanukkah it happens during that period they only have enough oil for one day but yet the oil burns for eight days which is how long they needed the, the, the lights to burn for them to rededicate the temple after Antiochus Epiphany slaughtered a pig in the temple what a terrible thing to do so there was activity of God but there's no prophecy there's no prophet 
walking on the earth. And the, the, the great hope for the coming of Messiah is built within the people of Israel. This is where so many of these verses that are known as Messianic verses, the, some of the ones I've been reading through this series, this is where this all pops up. The expectation on Israel that the Messiah is coming, the Messiah will come. The question was, who is it going to be? And every Jewish woman in Israel in those days wanted to be the mother of the Messiah. What a great blessing it would be. And what's really interesting is in the gospel stories of the New Testament, the Messiah comes in ways no one expected. Not through a woman who's married perhaps to a rich king or a nice prince, but a woman who's not married at all, she's betrothed to another man. And she's told, pardon me, she's told, you will be pregnant. She even says, how can this be for, I, I, I have no husband, I, I'm a virgin. And that's when the, the angel promises her, the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. This is going to be a thing from God. And she says, one of the greatest phrases in the scripture text, behold, the bond servant of the Lord, let God do to me as he wills. And all the consequences that can come from that. This Matthew passage is one of those consequences, as I've already said. Her betrothed husband finds out she's pregnant. It isn't his kid. He wants to get rid of her. Righteous or unrighteous, it doesn't matter. He wants to get rid of her. But he's told by an angel, probably the same one that visited Mary. No, 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 no. This whole thing, Joseph, is of God. And you need to understand the fulfillment Actually, the angel doesn't say this. Matthew says it. The fulfillment of the, uh, uh, of the hope in Isaiah of the virgin giving birth. This is what your wife will be. She will give birth to a son. And you will call him Yeshua because he will save his people from their sin. And in that passage is when Matthew reminds us of what Isaiah says. And he will call him Emmanuel, God with us. If you listen to my sermon last week, you know what I said. The majority of the people in Israel expected the pillar of fire and the cloud of smoke. They don't get that. Instead, they get a baby. Within the Christmas narratives, of, especially of the Gospel of Luke, we see a knight and shepherds are visited by an angel. They're told, in the city of David is born to you this day. A Savior who is Christ the Lord. Go and see, this is good news of a great joy. And these people, they go. And other people start coming. Sometime within that night in two years, wise men, magi from the east, they come. And they, they come with a message. Where is he that is born king of the Jews? None, none of this was an expectation of what the Messiah would. Everybody's going to know who the Messiah is. But the promise here is he is Yeshua. He will save his people from their sins. And he is God with us, even though it's in a way that we don't expect. And that ends up being the challenge of the 33 years of Jesus' life. Who is this man? I said that I believe Mary. So that's probably one of the most important phrases in the scripture. Behold the bond servant, the willing slave of God. Do to me as you will. This passage in Matthew ends with this phrase. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and he took Mary home as his wife. You know, I wonder what his family thought of that. They, they, they had to know. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son. And she gave him, and he gave him, the name Jesus. By the way, a little sidebar here. Something from, from David Stern, the uh, author of the Complete Jewish Bible, and also the author of the Complete Jewish Bible Commentary. He points out in the Gospel of Luke that it tells us that at the 40th day, Jesus is dedicated at the temple, which is what you do to the firstborn male child. 
at that dedication. The priest holding the baby would have said, who is this child? Joseph would have stepped forward and said, he is my son, Yeshua. And the baby would have been blessed and given back to the father and to the mother. And even though that baby was not physically Joseph's son because of what he says in front of the priest, that child has every right and claim to Joseph and what Joseph has and what Joseph doesn't have. He then becomes Joseph's son. Joseph does exactly what the angel said. He took him as his own. Now, we don't know what happens to Joseph. He kind of vanishes in the picture. Luke's gospel gets a little snotty, we might say, when they refer to Jesus as Mary's son. No Jewish man is called by the name of his mother. But yet they recall him this, isn't this Mary's son? That's in the gospel of Luke. That's a put down. Oh, we, we, we know the whole story. We know you were pregnant before all this goes on. And, and this is something that Joseph takes on, just as Mary takes it on when she says, let it be done unto me. They both take this on. This becomes their legacy. We don't know what happened to Joseph. He vanishes in the gospel. Did he die? Was he older than Mary? Well, there's all kinds of speculations out there. But we know this. He took him as his son. And he raised him as his son. I find myself wondering how many times in Joseph's life as he holds his son and, and Mary had other, other children. Jesus is mentioned as having at least four brothers and we know he had at least two sisters. Although they're not named like the brothers are, it does say that his brothers and his sisters are here with us. But this, this child, this one in this circumstance, how many times did Joseph look at him and go, God will be salvation, huh? What does that mean? I don't know. I do know as we read the end of the story, we know that it is true. Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, dies for us and rose again, conquering sin and death, and says, that is your gift from the one called Yeshua. It's a fascinating story, folks. And to me, it's more than a story. It is the reality of where we are. God is with us. Because you see, Jesus' death wasn't the end of the story, was it? He rose, he rose again. Paul says that he appeared to over 500 people after his resurrection. And when Paul's writing that, he says, more than half of those are still alive today. When Paul was writing that part of the, what becomes the New Testament, 30, 40 years after Jesus, there are those people that were still walking around and said, I saw him. They, 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 he can go to them. This person did, that person did. Me. I saw the resurrected Jesus. And the story goes on and it builds and it grows the story of the resurrected Lord because God is with us offering us salvation. Today, those are stories in a book. But is God still offering us salvation? Is God still with us? For me, Christmas is more than just the things that I like about it. And you, if you listen to me at all, at any time in the past, you know that this is my favorite time of the year. And you know, I, I love the colors, I love the decorations. You've been to my house. Uh, <laughs> well, not too many religious symbols in what I put out, okay? <laughs> there is the occasional manger here and there, manger scene. Uh, but, you know, I've got a lot of secular stuff in my house also. One time we had a contest, a trivia contest. How many Santas are in my house? Well, there was only set, there were over 70 of them at that time. And that was over 15 years ago. 
So I love the secular imagery of Christmas as much as I love the religious imagery of Christmas. But overall, there's one thing that for me is true. And the bottom line about this season, brothers and sisters, God is with us. He came to us in the form of Yeshua. He died for us. He rose again. He came back. And now we look forward to whenever that will be that he will come back a second time and redeem everyone. Probably a lot of us have been going, can it happen now? Because I'm tired of wearing masks and not going places. Well, you know, <laughs> there are worse things that can happen to us. But there's nothing better that can happen to us than this. God is with us. Amen? Amen. God is with us in the middle of COVID. God is with us in the middle of the storm. God is with us regardless of what comes. And always remember this, in our best day, God is with us. Amen. God, we thank you for your blessing. We thank you for your promise. We thank you for your gift. We talk about Christmas gifts. We give them because of the wise men bringing you gifts. That's where the tradition comes from. But God, the greatest gift that we have in this season is the reminder that we have you and therefore we have God with us. So Lord, lead us as your people. And we know that you are with us in time of darkness as well as you are with us in great time of light. For Emmanuel is here. God, we thank you for that. Guide us this week and may we have a great celebration of the birth of the Savior this Friday. God, we thank you for all these things now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Been hearing a lot about the Christmas star supposed to be coming back. I don't know if it will or not. It's supposed to appear somewhere around December the 22nd, but the, the uh, uh, I want to say the conjecture, that's not what it is. Uh, what's the word? It's, it's con something. Conjunction. Else. Conjunction of of the two planets are supposed to line up and the last time that happened was over 300 years ago i don't know am i going to get up at four o'clock in the morning go outside and look at the sky i don't know but if you do i hope you see it and remember that led people to bethlehem be blessed folks god is with us emmanuel praise be to